Hello, my name is Sister Mary Rose Reddy. I'm here to speak to you about one of my favorite books, Theology for Beginners by Frank Shee. This book was originally published in 1958, but it's still amazingly relevant. I think it will continue on being relevant because of all the power of thought that has gone into this book. And you can get a free copy of it if you go to Dynamic Catholic and you'll just only have to pay for the postage. So to begin with, I want to think about the fear of the Lord, because what I find with this book is that it really has helped me to learn the fear of the Lord, which as we learn from scripture is something that can be taught. It tells us in Psalm 34, come children and hear me, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. And in Proverbs 9, 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So just to get an idea of a little bit of an idea of the awesomeness of our God and creator, let's think about a few facts. One of them is that if you were going to count up to a billion, just one second at a time, it would take you 31.7 years to do that. And if you're going to count up to a trillion, it would count, it would take you 31,700 years to count to a trillion if you were just counting one number per second. So keeping that fact in mind, let's think about the size of our universe. Now, the Milky Way galaxy that we live in is estimated to contain 100 billion stars. Remember that to count up to a billion takes 31 years. Okay, but our, our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, is only one of an estimated 2 trillion galaxies that are in the universe. So if you multiply those numbers together, um, scientists estimate that the total number of stars in the universe is 200 billion trillion. And it says in Baruch, he calls each of the stars by name. He calls each of the stars by name. And that's who our God is. And that's who we're called to open our minds to learn about. Our minds were created to know God. And that's why I love this book so much, because it really has helped me to know God better. So why do we study theology? That's his first chapter, Frank Sheet's first chapter in this book. And the answer really is joy, joy, because our minds were created. Like if you think about what Jesus said was the first commandment when he was asked by the, by the scribe, what is the first commandment in the law? He said, the first commandment of the law is you shall love the Lord your God with your whole heart, your whole soul, your whole mind, and your whole strength. And so in order to know him with our whole mind, we have to continually learn about him. And because God is an infinite subject, there's no end to our learning about him for all eternity we'll be learning more about god and every new new thing we learn will be a joy to us an increase of joy so let's begin on the earth and i, I take excerpts now from directly from the text of frank sheet's book and i want to um comment on on these particular texts like first she, he was talking about how uh he was speaking to this woman, like this woman asked him, like, what is going to be the topic of your talk tonight? And, and um, he said, the blessed Trinity. And the woman said, oh, like as if, as if that was something going to be very boring. And so Frank, she said she expected no joy. So we, we anticipate that we are going to be living with God in eternity for all eternity. And that just to see God, the beatific vision is going to make us happy forever. And so why would we think that there would be no joy in studying what will be our constant food of joy for all eternity? So our, our minds were made to feast on the knowledge of God. God is the infinite beauty. God isn't just beautiful. He is beauty. He isn't just love. He, he isn't just loving. He is love. And every other attribute we could say of him, that he is that attribute. He isn't just like some of it or part of it, he's the source of it. He's the source of beauty, the source of wisdom, the source of goodness, the source of love. 
So Frank Sheet is saying it was, it's always been strange to him. It was always strange to him that he had to argue this case, like that people should want to learn about God because he himself had found so much joy in the study of theology. And I think that if you really take the time to read this book, you'll experience that joy because the more we know about God, the more we love him. So he, he speaks to us about satisfying the hunger we have for truth. And in each one of our souls, because we are created in God's image, we have a hunger for the good, the true, and the beautiful. Every single person God ever created has that hunger for the good, the true, and the beautiful. So truth is food to our hearts and souls and minds. Truth is light. So Frank, she talks about how the when Jesus was being tempted in the desert, when the devil said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become loaves of bread. Jesus said, not by bread alone does man live, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. And so that's something for us to think about, like, what do we feed our intellects on? What do we feed our minds on? The two great powers of our soul are our intellect, by which we know, and our will, by which we love. So what we feed our intellect with is going to determine the health of our soul. So revealed truth then is food. Now it is a peculiar, peculiarity of food that it nourishes only those who eat it. So what Frank Sheet is trying to tell us here is, you know, it's good to think about, oh, well, I'm glad that person has a degree in theology or I'm glad they're studying theology, but what other people know about God isn't going to satisfy your hunger to know about him. He's your father. You, you need to learn to know him and to love him so that he can fill your soul with all that he wants to fill it with. See, the, the problem is that we are created out of nothing. And so we we're being called into union with the infinite. And in order for the for nothing to contain the infinite, it has to receive a capacity to be able to contain that infinite. And God did give us that capacity in our blessed mother Mary, the Immaculate Conception. And so I recommend to you that you develop, if you don't already have, a devotion to our blessed mother, because she's the one who is going to help you to understand theology and to understand scripture, which all theology is based on. But without our blessed mother, we it's kind of like, if I take off my glasses, uh, there's very few things I can see clearly because I'm so nearsighted. So like having our blessed mother as our guide as we study theology is like putting on real sharp focus glasses. So God reveals his beauty to us. He, it's his desire to reveal his beauty to us because he knows that once we taste that beauty, like it's it says in Psalm 34, taste and see that the Lord is sweet. Once we've tasted that sweetness of God, nothing else on earth really can have quite the same appeal as it once had because we all know the frustration of trying to satisfy our desires with the things of earth, it's just not possible because there's, there's a longing in our souls for the infinite and God alone can satisfy that longing. So the more we learn of truth, the more light we have in our intellect. So not to know the truth is to be in darkness. To see it wrong is to be in double darkness. But then he makes an important point. The greater part of reality can be known only if God tells us. Doctrine is what he tells us. Lacking it, we lack light. So, for example, one chapter in the book is going to be on the Blessed Trinity. The doctrine of the Blessed Trinity is the highest doctrine of the Catholic faith. The fact that there's only one God, but that one God is three persons, three co-eternal, co-equal persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that we wouldn't know except that Jesus Christ himself revealed it to us at the Last Supper. If you read um, what is referred to as the Book of Glory, that is John chapter 13 through the end of his gospel, the Book of Glory, 
which begins at the Last Supper, where Jesus makes many references to the Holy Spirit and to the Father, so that we begin to understand a little bit, which is all we really have the capacity to understand, of, of who God is and how beautiful he is. So we need to know what our the food of everlasting life is. If you remember, in the Garden of Eden, there were two trees. There was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And I mean, multiple other trees as well, but, but those particular trees were special because the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the tree that caused the downfall of the whole, our whole humanity because Adam and Eve were doubting the goodness of the father. They were, they were thinking that the father was withholding something from them and that they had to grasp for it what was really being freely given to them and freely offered to them. But then after they committed original sin, we know that it says in Genesis that God put them out of the garden and he put cherubim with flaming sword, flaming swords at the entrance so they couldn't get back in because he didn't want them to eat from, from the tree of everlasting life because if they ate from that tree, they would live forever. And God, it wasn't that he didn't want them to live forever. It was that he didn't want them to live forever in their fallen state. And so Christ came and redeemed us. He died on the cross and rose from the dead and gave us the sacrament of baptism so that we could become one body with him. He feeds us with his own body and blood in the Eucharist. And so now we do feed on the tree of everlasting life. Like, like Jesus said in John chapter 6, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has life everlasting, and I will raise him up on the last day. So there's no limit to the beauty of the food that we're being offered in the Eucharist. But we're also offered that, that food in what Mother Paul Marie refers to as the Eucharist of the mind, which is sacred scripture. So we come into communion with, with Jesus Christ in a very special way when we are meditating on and relishing the sacred scriptures. So Frank Sheed here is speaking about how every Catholic has some nourishment because of the fact of the Blessed Sacrament, the fact of receiving the Holy Eucharist, where we receive God himself into our own bodies. But we need to think about how we receive the Eucharist. Like, do we take time when Jesus is physically present within us for those 15 minutes or so? Do we take time to thank him and to listen to him and to love him and to welcome him as our best friend forever? Because that's who he is. And so often, I'm guilty of this myself, of just almost forgetting that he's even there. And yet he is the food. He is the bread of life. So we have that great gift in the Catholic Church, but we can go much further into that doctrine. And we are invited every day with every Holy Communion to enter more deeply into the mystery of his communicating to us his own living body, blood, soul, and divinity. So an another point Frank Sheed brings out in chapter one is that ignorance is not virtue. So often people would say to him things like, well, you know, I know the church teaches that, but, you know, I think I know enough to get by. You know, think of how many of adult Catholics are kind of limping along on maybe a third grade knowledge of the faith. You know, we don't do that in any other subject. We don't do that in math. We don't expect that um, people will only pro progress to knowing um, like the basic multiplication tables and go no further than that. But we do that in, so often I think we do that in the teaching of the faith. We think, oh, well, you know, like even, um, I, I mean, I've so often taught children and um, even older children, like high school children, you know, about the 10 commandments. And then I'll say, well, okay, you need to know the, the 10 commandments. And they'll say, in order? I say, well, yeah, and I mean, God gave them in a certain order for a certain reason. But what has to be broken through is that the thought that it's not interesting to study theology, that it's such a lie of Satan. 
that there's nothing more interesting than studying theology because we're studying God and God is love. And what's more interesting than love? So let's think about how, because we all are ignorant in ways that we shouldn't be. We all should know more than we do because uh, part of our fallen human nature is sloth, like laziness. And sometimes it takes effort, you know, for us to learn these truths, but it, it's sometimes like I'd rather just drift along and not have to really focus my mind, but it's important to do so because you earn, you, you, it's like you're earning your bread, you know, you're earning your bread by the work that you're doing because there's the intellectual work as well as physical work. So um, Frank Sheen mm -hmm. speaks of how knowledge serves love. And I think of the example of um, Gloria Anson, who was one who was the main, one of the main pro promoters of the Sacred Heart Enthronement. And she used to tell the story of how when she had fallen in love with her husband before she married him, she used to go to her husband Jack's mother and say, tell me about Jack. Because she just wanted to know everything she could know about that man who she had fallen in love with. But how much more should we want to know about our God, our creator, the one who has loved us from all eternity and who has called us into being? And so Frank she warns us that knowledge does serve love. It can become conceit or pride as it did in Lucifer. But but we, if, if we're staying close to our Blessed Mother and St. Joseph, we won't face that temptation so much because we understand they will teach us how to be humble of heart like they are. And even Jesus himself, if you think the one virtue he pointed out, he said, learn of me for I am meek and humble of heart and you will find rest for your souls. So it, it can serve, um, the more we understand what God has taught us, the more that we are, it removes misunderstandings we might have about the faith. And so it helps us to be able to defend the faith because for example, people are always, um, questioning the the presence of evil like they'll say like if god is good why is there death why is there sorrow why why is there evil and these are questions that have always tormented the fallen human race and we know that the answer is is sin because um sin is what brought suffering sorrow and death into the world but but god has done something very special with all of those and that is by his redemption by jesus dying on the cross he gave us the power to unite our sufferings to him, to his sufferings, so that they in turn become redemptive for those that we love. Now, the other reason for learning about theology and learning about God is to help relieve the famine that is around us. In Amos, we read that God said he was going to send a famine, not a famine of bread, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. And I think that we can clearly see we're living in that type of famine right now in the 21st century. So we're, there's around us, we see people starving to death for the food of truth. They're looking for truth in all different alleys and um, dark caves. And, and they're finding misery because they're, they're not looking in the right place. They're not looking at the true God. But God has shown us his light. He has said to us, you are the light of the world. A city set on a mountain cannot be hidden. We need to shine that light. Jesus said, so let your works let your works be seen before men in order that they may glorify God, glorify the Father. And then just a few chapter, a few verses after that in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, take heed not to do your good before men in order to be seen by them. Otherwise you shall have no reward with your Father in heaven. But but he's talking about the motive in order to be seen by them. But so so we shouldn't be doing good work so that people will look at us and say, oh, isn't that person good? <laughs> but but we should be doing good works because we need to shine that light into the into the world. The world is starving for the truth and for the beauty and for the good. And we God showed it to us. So we, we can't let the people be starving around us. We can't be lazy in this regard. So we have to be the ones to learn the truths of our faith with clarity and that so that we can communicate them to others. And I found in my life that 
I've learned much more by teaching than by listening. And I know that sounds kind of odd, but in order to teach, you have to be able to understand it with clarity. So I would recommend that you would find a person who you could teach, even, I mean, a child or maybe another adult, and just tell them the truth about God. Tell them something beautiful that you learned about God. And that's going to fix it more deeply in your own heart. So it, it is intolerable that men should be perishing for want of truth that we could bring them. So there's a twofold need. First, there's the need of our own souls for the food and light and love of God. And then there's the need of all the people about us that we can help to meet if we first ourselves learn the truth. Like, the, you know, the famous saying, um, you can't you can't give what you don't have. So first, you need to eat the food that God is offering to you with the food of truth and love and beauty. And then you'll be able to share it with those people around you who are also so hungry for that same food. As Jeremiah says, when I found your words, I devoured them. So once we begin to understand that God is real and God is love and he's in love with us, then everything changes. Everything changes. Like Mother Paul Marie used to tell her students to read the sacred scriptures every day for 15 minutes. And that if they were faithful to that practice, that after a time, that the words would come right off the page and enter into their hearts. And I, I do believe that's true, especially of sacred scripture, because it's the living word of God. And Frank Sheed emphasizes in his book that we have to read the whole of sacred scripture eventually. I mean, don't start out with Genesis and try to read straight on through, especially because when you get to Leviticus, you're going to be... <laughs> Oh, no, I can't continue. But but I would recommend that you start with the Gospels. And that's what Frank Sheed recommends. Start with the Gospels and then um, the letters of St. Paul. I mean, you could read the book of Genesis, the book of Exodus, the Psalms. So choose out certain books that that are more, I would, I would say they're easier to read to begin with. And then find a good Bible study, like, for example, the Bible in a year would be a good one for you to listen to that podcast if you want, if you wanted to go through the whole Bible. So thank you. And our next class will be on chapter two, which is on spirit, which is my favorite chapter of the whole book. So thank you. And I appreciate you having joined for this brief introduction. <laughs>